Chris is going to talk about can you be a stoic and a political activist? I would hope so, but well, we'll, we'll see. Okay, thanks, thanks uh, for the invitation and and all the organisation and and so on. It's wonderful, uh, wonderful to to see this all going forward. Well, can you be a stoic and a political activist? How's the volume? Okay. Sorry, higher. Okay. The answer to this question is certainly yes. And I'll go on as I'll go on to explain. It may seem puzzling why anyone would think there is a contradiction between these two things. But people do sometimes think that. For instance, at last year's Stoicon, Vincent Deary, a British social worker and writer, was critical of the idea of modern Stoicism. Deary thought that being a Stoic under modern conditions meant accepting your situation in life, whatever this was, even if this was the result of social injustice. And so he praised a client of his, an elderly widow, who responded to her situation in a rebellious and angry spirit because she saw it as the result of injustice rather than what he saw as the stoic response of putting up with this. The ancient stoics did urge us to accept in a calm spirit things that are genuinely inevitable. Above all, the fact of our own future death and that of other people, including those uh, we love. But this does not mean that we should accept unjust situations, which are not inevitable and are the result of deliberate human action. On the contrary, the Roman Stoics in particular were well known for challenging what they saw as political injustice. In that sense, they were well known for being political activists and may provide models for us in this respect. The key to understanding Stoic thinking, ancient Stoic thinking on political involvement, like much else in Stoic ethics, is their theory of ethical development, progress. The Stoics believe that there is a pattern of lifelong ethical development, as Julia mentioned earlier, that is natural for human beings, that expresses human nature at its best. And we should do all we can to take this process forward. This pattern of ethical development consists in two interconnected strands. In one strand, centered on value, we gradually gain a better understanding of the virtues, of what these involve, and how to embed these in our lives. The Stoics thought there were four generic virtues, wisdom, courage, justice, and self-control, and that these were interconnected and inseparable. Also, we gradually recognize that living in line with the virtues is what really matters in human life, what brings us real happiness. The second strand of ethical development centers on our relationship to other people. The Stoics believed that Alongside the natural motive of self-preservation, there was a second natural motive, namely to care for others of our own kind. This instinct, they thought, was natural to all animals, not just humans. Uh, and the love of parents for children, they took for in, among animals as well as humans, as well as uh, human animals, uh, is a clear example of this motive. As we develop, human beings express this motive in more complex and rational ways, and in ways that also express a growing understanding of the virtues. This leads, they thought, to two main kinds of outcomes. One 
is social involvement in family, community, or political life in a way that uh, expresses our understanding of the virtues. Another, another is the recognition that all human beings, because they're all capable of this process of rational ethical development, are in some sense brothers and sisters to us, or fellow members of a single world community. Although different sources uh, uh, for Stoicism emphasize one or other of these outcomes, they're often, um, they're often seen as compatible or mutually supporting. Social or political involvement in a specific local context is achieved in the best way if it is combined with recognition of the fundamental kinship or co-citizenship of all human beings as rational agents. Now this stoic theory of ethical development, which is a quite general theory applying to lots of aspects of, of life, but it makes the best sense, I think, of their thinking on political involvement. Now, our evidence for their ideas on this is quite limited, and as with other topics, different ancient stakes seem to have interpret, interpreted the theory in somewhat different ways. But there are some consistent themes. First of all, the Stoics thought that other things being equal, we should get involved in community and political life in our own specific and local context. Their views on this were quite unlike the Epicureans, for instance, who thought that such involvement was likely to undermine our peace of mind. Secondly, the Stoics thought that our involvement should be carried out in a way that also expressed and promoted our understanding of the virtues of wisdom, courage, justice, and self-control. Thirdly, our involvement at a local level should also reflect the recognition that although different kinds of people have different claims on us, all human beings as such have a kinship and co-citizenship with us. These principles have a direct bearing on the sense in which Stoicism encourages us to be politically active. It also has a bearing on being stoic and being a political activist, which usually means, in modern English, challenging the established political order in some way. So I'll now give some examples of how the ancient stoics put these ideas into practice, and then I'll discuss how they might help us formulate our approach today. First of all, were the ancient Stoics, in fact, active in politics? And if so, how? Well, in thinking about this, it's worth bearing in mind that for much of the time that ancient Stoicism was, was practiced, from the third century BCE to the second century uh, CE, Greece and later Rome were ruled by kings or emperors even though at other times Athens had been a democracy and Rome was a republic. It's also worth noting that for the most part, and unlike some other ancient philosophies, Stoicism didn't consistently recommend one form of democracy as the best absolutely. Rather, the Stoics maintained that whatever context we find ourselves in, with some exceptions noted shortly. Whatever our context, we should be involved politically in a way that's consistent with our own specific situation in life, our character, our talents, and our ethical principles. In Hellenistic Greece, that is from about the third century to the first century BCE, this meant either involvement in local or community politics as opposed to national politics, 
or being a philosophical advisor to a king, and some Stoics seem to have played that role. Also, simply being a philosophical teacher in Athens, which often meant teaching and arguing in a public place, and that's why the Stoics were called Stoics, because they, uh, they taught in the Stoa, which was a public open space. So simply being uh, a teacher, a philosophical teacher in public, was regarded as a kind of public or political role. In Rome, rather differently from Hellenistic Greece, a number of members of the political elite adopted Stoicism as their philosophy and combined this with various forms of political involvement. Um, so uh, these included being a, a leading politician and general under the, under the uh, Republic, Cato the Younger, being advisor to an emperor, Seneca, who was advisor to Nero, and being the emperor himself, in the case of Marcus Aurelius. At the other end of the social scale, Epictetus, an ex-slave, took on the role of a philosophical teacher. He had no direct involvement in politics, but he taught many students who went on into political life. So overall, ancient Stoics seem to have practiced what they preached, and they, have, and they became involved in politics to an extent that was feasible for their context and their personal situation. But how far did this involvement express distinctively Stoic values? And did this lead them to what we might call political activism, that is, challenging political authority on the grounds of injustice? Well, this is in fact a very well-marked feature of political life in the late Roman Republic and uh, under the empire. Um, it mainly took the form of what you might call exemplary gestures uh, designed to signal moral disapproval of a given political ruler or regime, typically a dictator, a tyrant, or an emperor. Although Stoicism didn't reject sole rule as a constitutional form and didn't uh, reject any given constitutional form, they rejected tyrannical abuse of power, seeing it as an exercise of injustice in the political sphere. This, is, this attitude, this challenge to tyranny, is the common thread underlying a series of famous exemplary gestures by Stoics. Cato committed suicide in a very deliberate and obvious way, rather than submit to what he saw as Julius Caesar's illegitimate and unjust replacement of the Roman Republic by dictatorship, a number of Roman senators signaled their disapproval of the injustice of the, of the emperor in power at a given time, for instance, Nero or Domitian, by refusing to attend the Senate, by remaining silent when they went to the Senate, or by work walking out in protest. These gestures, these gestures were recognized as challenges to the regime, and they often led to exile or execution. And there was, in fact, a general expulsion of philosophers under Domitian in response to this kind of attitude. When Seneca, the former advisor to Nero, attempted to retire from his role as Nero's advisor because it was clear that his attempt to control Nero's excesses had failed, this was taken as a gesture of disapproval and led to Seneca's enforced suicide. Now, these are clear cases where Stoic principles 
refusal to be complicit in an unjust political order led certain Romans from being politically active to being political activists, using exemplary gestures in the way, in the same way that Gandhi did successfully in his campaign of passive resistance to the British rule of India, which he saw as unjust. So we have, I've given examples then of the Stoics as politically active and political activists and shown how that reflects their, their, their principles, their underlying belief, their philosophy and their ethics. This strand of, of Stoic activity, what you might call Stoic activism, is summed up in this passage from Marcus Aurelius. Through him, Severus, I've come to understand Thrasia, Helvidius, these are two of the Stoics who, who um, express these political uh, gestures, Cato, Dio, Brutus, and I've grasped the idea of a state based on equality before the law, which is administered according to the principles of equality and freedom of speech, and of a monarchy which values above all the liberty of its subjects. Now, this passage of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations sums up two features of Stoic political thought uh, noted so far. It refers to a number of well-known Stoic activists, and it also sums up Marcus's, Marcus's own credo as an emperor. Although not all Stoics would necessarily have shared this ideal, it clearly represents a Stoic type of ideal, namely Marcus's attempt to play his role in life as an emperor in a way that's consistent with trying to express the virtues in a specific political context. What about the Stoic idea of the brotherhood of humanity or the co our co-citizenship in the world? What role did this play in their political thinking? Sometimes it provided a kind of objective or broader framework for more localized political action and place this in a broader moral framework. As for instance, in this quotation uh, from Marcus Aurelius again, as Antoninus, this was his official name as, a, as an emperor, as Antoninus, my city and fatherland is Rome. As a human being, it is the universe. It is only what benefits these cities that benefits that is good for me. At other times, this idea is brought uh, more directly into moral or political decision making. Antipater was one of the Hellenistic heads of the Stoic school, and he argued that when we're doing business, for instance, selling a house, we should be open and honest about the faults of the property, even if we make less money, bearing in mind that all those involved, all those buying and those selling, are members of the brotherhood of humankind and deserve just treatment. Cicero, though he wasn't a Stoic himself, he sometimes adopted Stoic principles as the best available, and he maintained that anyone who becomes a tyrant, an unjust ruler, puts himself outside the brotherhood of humanity or the body of rational human agents. More controversially, he maintained that this principle justified the assassination, the killing of Julius Caesar in 44 BCE. These examples give us some idea how the idea of the brotherhood of humankind was used to support both political involvement and social and political activism in the sense I'm considering here, challenging the status quo. 
Well, finally, moving from antiquity to now, what lessons can we learn from Stoic thinking and practice on this subject that might help us today? I don't want to suggest, I don't believe, that Stoic political principles provide a straightforward answer to any given political question. I don't think it, it would uh, tell us how we should have voted in the recent British referendum on our membership of the EU or in the uh, upcoming US election. But I think Stoicism can provide ideas on which we can reflect in making the decision we make. In particular, I think the Stoic idea of the brotherhood of humankind or co-citizenship of the world has a special value for us in the present political climate. Many of the most intense debates today on both sides of the Atlantic center on how we should respond to the claims of refugees from war zones, how we should respond to people who want to become immigrants in our country, or how we should treat people whose religion is different from our own or from that which is prevalent in our country. I think the Stoic idea of the brotherhood of humankind can help to place those questions in a broader perspective and can bring home to us that treating whole classes of people who differ from us in one of these ways as somehow less than human or wholly outside the boundaries of our ethical concern is morally unacceptable. More generally, I believe the stoic approach of locating questions of political involvement and activism within the broader framework of ethics and ethical development is a helpful one. I think there's great value in trying to view one's life as an ongoing project of ethical progress, centered on bringing together our growing understanding of the virtues and of how to treat people better. And I think this view can help us adopt a more thoughtful and constructive view of political engagement than is often held. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for, uh, for questions. And you're right, this was better than an early lunch. You're right. <laughs> OK. All right. Do you see a way to extend the sense of the brotherhood of humanity beyond the realm of humanity to animals, for instance, whose suffering and happiness is affected by our action? Right. Um, Yes, I do think that. Actually, the Stoics are not thought of generally as very good, very sound on animals because they stress the difference between the rationality of human beings and the fact that animals are not rational. But I do think that, uh, that there are two ways in which they, they, they see animal, uh, non-human animals as valuable. One is that they embody, as we do, this primary instinct of care for others of our kind. So in that sense, we have a bond with animals. But the other thing is, I don't think they actually put this idea, well, in a way they do put this idea forward. They think that the universe is providentially organized in the sense that, in the sense that we uh, are, it's inbuilt in us to want to ex exercise providential care for others of our kind. And I think although they don't say this, that it would be a logical extension of their view to say that we should care for animals, other animals, and indeed for the environment which we, you know, which it, in which we live, of which they're a part. So I think it would be a, a logical extension of their view. The, the examples uh, that you gave were all uh, protests. Of yes. A kind of passive sort, and I'm wondering 
where stoicism might offer guidance, or if it would, on more disruptive kinds of protests, ranging from civil disobedience all the way to revolution. You mean, what would they think about that? Well, I think they would think it would depend entirely on the situation. But in, in many situations, I think they would think that civil disobedience was exactly the right way to behave. Um, revolution might be, if that's the only way of achieving, you know, uh, a better result. The main point is that the, the, for them, the politics has to match the ethics. It's got to match the ethical principles. And if it doesn't, then you do something about it. <laughs> Can I duck that one, please? I think any thoughtful uh, person listening to my talk will be n not be in any great doubt as to which of the two candidates I would be voting for. But I'd rather not make it too 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 uh, too uh, local, as it were. Thanks, Thanks Rhys.